What is philosophy? As we begin our study of philosophy, it makes sense to start with asking for a definition of what it is exactly that we're going to be studying. In other words, what is philosophy? Now, it seems that this should have an obvious or sort of easy answer. For example, if you ask somebody who's taking algebra, what are you doing in algebra? What is algebra? Well, there's a pretty easy way to explain what algebra is, right? It's the use of numbers, solving for variables, and so forth. You can talk about what it is you do when you're actually doing algebra. And similarly, when you study history, you can define, well, what is it I'm doing? I'm studying the past. I'm studying events that took place in the past, maybe perhaps looking for explanations of why those events happened. But nonetheless, it's pretty clear that when you're studying history, we understand what it is we're doing. When it comes to philosophy, it's not always that clear what it is philosophers are doing. So there are a number of competing notions about what it is philosophers actually do. So when I say I'm engaged in some sort of philosophic enterprise, what does that actually mean? Right? When philosophers say I'm working on a philosophic problem, what is that? What does it mean to work on a philosophic problem or what does it mean to do philosophy? So what we hope to do in this first chapter is simply give you an overview of the number of different ways that philosophers have defined what it is they do. And so we'll go through a number of these various um, definitions of philosophy. And it should it's worth pointing out right at the beginning that there isn't any one agreed upon approach to philosophy. Some view it as a subject matter. Some will view it as a process or a procedure, a methodology, way of doing things. Some view it as sort of a way of life, a way of questioning or self-reflection. So there are a number of different things, and we'll go over each of these. Um, to give you just some idea of what it is that philosophers do. Oftentimes, the best way to sort of get a handle on what philosophy is, is to see how it's actually done. So as we go through our textbook and we go through the various readings that are provided for you, you'll start to see what it is philosophers do. And hopefully at the end, you'll have come to sort of your own understanding or perhaps your own preferred approach to philosophy. One very easy way to define philosophy is just to look at the word itself. So if we look at the word philosophy, philo means love, and sophia means wisdom. So if we go to the ancient Greece, philosophy is literally the love of wisdom. Now, in some ways, this idea sort of permeates all the various um, definitions of philosophy that we're going to look at. So the idea, the idea of a love of wisdom is the end result, the wisdom that we seek is the end result of all of the various approaches to philosophy. Before examining the various definitions of philosophy or the ways in which philosophy has been interpreted, I'd like to sort of share with you what some contemporary philosophers have thought about the very thing that they've been doing. So this recording comes from a website, it's actually a podcast called Philosophy Bites, as in little bites of philosophy. So they're normally short, little sort of 20-minute um, discussions about a particular philosophic issue or topic. And this, if you're interested, can be found at www.philosophybites.com. So I'd just like to sort of listen to this approach or to the various approaches that contemporary philosophers, people working in the field from all over the world, and this is mainly in Western analytic philosophy, um, how they define the very project um, that they're engaged in. So just going to listen, listen for a few minutes. There's several different definitions. I'll sort of go through and make some quick notes. And then as we go through each of the various definitions um, that we'll be discussing after this, you'll see how a lot of these um, various individuals, these various philosophers, can be fit into one or more of the various approaches. So when someone asks, what is philosophy? Some of them have very distinct views that fall into a very distinct category. Others have a view of philosophy that sort of overlaps the different definitions. So let's start with this excerpt from Philosophy Bites. Over the past couple of years, Philosophy Bites have been asking philosophers a simple question, and a question to which you would expect them to know the answer. What is philosophy? Here are some of their answers. I'm Don Cupid. 
Philosophy for me is critical thinking, trying to become aware of how one's own thinking works, of all the things one takes for granted, of the way in which one's own thinking shapes the things you're thinking about. Tony Dickinson, what do you think philosophy is? Well, philosophy is what I was told as an undergraduate that women couldn't do (laughs) by an eminent philosopher who had best remain nameless on this site, I think. To me, it is always, and this is probably a rather trite thing to say, but it is the gadfly image. It's the Socratic gadfly. It's refusing to accept any platitudes or accepted wisdom without examining it. Chandran Kukutas, what is philosophy? My understanding of philosophy probably owes more to Michael Oakeshott than to anybody else. I think of philosophy as an attempt to think systematically about the presuppositions of a given topic to try to understand that topic in terms of concepts that give you a complete account of something. So, for example, to the extent that philosophy discusses ethics, it tries to give you an account of what is the nature of morality, or to the extent that it discusses politics, it tries to give you an account of what politics is in terms of concepts that make sense of this phenomenon. Robert Rowan Smith, what would you say philosophy is? I think the Greek term has it exactly right. It's a way of loving knowledge. Raymond Tallis, what do you think philosophy is? Well, one of my favourite definitions comes from Wilfred Sellers, which he says is trying to see how things in the wider sense hang together in the wider sense. And I guess my dream of philosophy is to make the universe we live in mind-portable, so instead of being possessed by it, you possess it. Claire Carlyle, what do you think philosophy is? Well, most simply put, I think it's about making sense of all this, really. We find ourselves in a world that we haven't chosen. There are all sorts of possible ways of interpreting it and um, giving it meaning or finding meaning in the lives that we live. If there are pre-given meanings, then there are a range of them to choose from. Philosophy is about making sense of of that situation that we find ourselves in. Terence Irwin, what do you think philosophy is? Some people have said, and I agree with them, that it's the argument from things that seem perfectly obvious to a conclusion that's extremely surprising. Other people have said that it's a way to try to get clear about the basic presuppositions of claims that we tend to take for granted. So I think both of those are reasonably good ideas about what philosophy uh, tries to do, that it's not a terribly technical subject in its main aims. It starts with claims that are quite familiar, something's right or wrong, raises certain kinds of difficulties about them, and tries to achieve some more systematic understanding that will give us some insight into the claims that originally seem plausible and will remove some of the objections that occurred to us when we started to think about them. I think that's just a clumsy way of expressing what Socrates thought about, cross-questioning people to try to find out how far they did or didn't understand the things that seemed perfectly clear to them in order to try to get them to think so that they would achieve a greater level of understanding. Good morning. I'm Alan Buchanan. I'm the James B. Duke Professor of Philosophy at Duke University in North Carolina. I don't think it's any one thing, but I think that generally it involves being critical and reflective about things that most people take for granted. Julian Savalescu, what do you think philosophy is? Philosophy is, uh, in my view, gaining knowledge through the use of reason and conceptual tools, a priori reason, and by reflecting about oneself and the state of the world. It employs the empirical sciences, but it's not a version of science. It's gaining knowledge through rational reflection. And in my own particular area, philosophy is about understanding what people should do, what sort of person people should be, how people should act by rationally reflecting on the courses of action or the nature of human beings. What I think philosophy also should be doing is about encouraging people to gain knowledge and to reflect and to try to seek to understand the world and themselves through their capacity as rational animals. So, as you heard, there are a number of different views on what philosophy is. And some of them are overlapping, and others seem to be very different. So, some have the idea that you're engaged in simply critical thinking. 
Some is the gadfly, which we'll talk about later, what a gadfly is, if you don't know. It's sort of an annoying fly, kind of like a big horsefly. Um, systematic thinking about our presuppositions. So a number of these, you note, um, thinkers are talking about our presuppositions, what we assume, what seems obvious to us. And instead of just accepting that, we want sort of a systematic thinking about those. Are those things well-founded, for example? Some say it's a love of knowledge. Notice it was a little different than the love of wisdom, but the love of knowledge, how things hang together. So an explanation of the world around us, how we can sort of put this all together into one big sy systematic approach or coherent approach. Um, it's a way of finding meaning, and that might be meaning personally, meaning for ourselves, so in sort of a moral sense or character sense, finding meaning in the world around us, right, in terms of almost empirical or scientific type learning, which again, philosophy has at its origin sort of an approach or has a goal of trying to explain the natural world. So the earliest philosophers were natural philosophers. Um, take going from the obvious to the surprising, right? So when we accept certain things day to day, we don't normally think about what those implications of accepting those things are. And sometimes by starting with something that seems very obvious or accepted and then leading that, seeing what does that actually lead to when it's taken to its sort of logical extreme. Um, Additionally, we have cross-questioning, and we'll see this is in the Socratic method. And cross-questioning here meant that when someone holds a position, philosopher's job is to question them to make sure that they truly understand what it is they say they understand or what they know. And so this, this back and forth, some of you might be familiar with the Socratic method, is what some people think is what philosophers do. Um, being critical and reflective about the world around us, right? Not accepting things at face value. So when it's critical, look at these things and really ask sort of penetrating questions about what's going on. And then knowledge through reason or rational reflection, right? So reflecting on things, applying reason or rationality to our experiences. So all of these are ways in which contemporary philosophers view what it is they do in philosophy. So the first definition of philosophy is philosophy as a method. So when we talk about philosophy as a method, what we mean is the way in which we approach any subject matter. So it doesn't matter what it is I'm looking at. I could be looking at a question in ethics, or I could be looking at something in social political philosophy or metaphysics, questions about what is and what exists and how we can prove it. And instead of looking at any particular area, what philosophy is just the methodology by which we approach those problems. So one that is common to most, again, Western analytic philosophy, is the use of rational argument to justify claims about the world. So when we talk about a rational argument, what we mean is that we can't simply rely on what others have told us, or we can't rely on a statement like, that's just what I believe. In philosophy, to say that you have a particular belief is not enough. You have to be able to back that belief up with some sort of reason or evidence for your belief. So philosophy is about using rational arguments to justify claims. Um, it also can be viewed as conceptual or linguistic analysis. So an example of this, for example, if I said um, freedom is a good thing. Right? And I think we all agree that freedom is something we all want. Everyone wants to be free. But then the question might be, well, what do you mean when you say freedom? So when someone says, I should have the most freedom possible, well, does that freedom include the freedom to harm other people? And if you say, well, no, well, let's say, well, under what conditions um, is it the case that you're free? So if you're not free to harm other people, but are you free to harm other people if they threaten you? So is that what freedom entails? Freedom entails that I'm free to do everything I want, provided it doesn't harm others, but there might be cases when I can harm others. So you can see that it's very easy that the minute you start with something that's very simple, freedom's a good thing, we want freedom, the question is, well, what do you mean by freedom? And then that has to be defined, right? So identifying or looking at linguistically what we mean when we use the word freedom conceptually, what does that mean? Are we talking about freedom is just something you can do anytime, something that you can do anytime you want? Or is there something else going on? So that would be a conceptual or linguistic analysis, right? We'd start with asking those sorts of questions. And finally, there's the idea of philosophy as logic, or at least the methodology is using logic. And by logic, we can mean a number of different approaches. So for example, we might be talking about deductive logic, 
So movement from premises to conclusions. So we assume that the premises are true, and then we ask, do these lead to particular conclusions? And we'll be talking about this um, in the next part of the course. Um, we might be talking about inductive arguments. So rather than arguments that are where we assume the premises are true, an inductive argument might be one in which the conclusion is probably the case, right? So we do a lot of inductive or engage in a lot of inductive argumentation in the sciences, right? We say, well, we have a, a bunch of evidence that when action A is found, we often then find action B, right? The idea that A causes B is an inductive infer inference, right? A, a is here, so I kick the ball, ball rolls down the street. When the next day when I go out and I kick the ball, the ball rolls down the street. And the third and the fourth and every day when I kick the ball, it seems to have the same outcome, B, namely that the ball's rolling down the street. And from that, we conclude that the next time I kick the ball, the same effect is going to happen. That's an inductive argument. It's based on previous experience, right? I look at a number of cases. So some of what philosophers do might be based on this kind of reasoning, on deductive or inductive reasoning. And so we use that to justify certain claims based on logic. The next definition of philosophy is philosophy as subject matter. So rather than looking at the specific methodology, how it's done, whether it's logic or conceptual analysis or rational argument, rather than looking at the methodology, we might want to look at what it is the particular philosopher is actually studying. So there's um, questions about what exists metaphysics right are there are there minds and bodies so is there is the mind separate from the body or are these the same thing that would be a question about what exists right what is the nature of the world if you're a materialist you think that the world is composed of stuff right material stuff atoms and subatomic particles and things but are there other sort of entities in the world right are there spiritual entities so some philosophers have posited that there are things that are non-corporeal non-physical Right, so those would be metaphysical questions, questions about what exists, what is, or how can we explain the world around us. The next might be the subject, um, subject containing questions about what we know. This is what we call epistemology. Right, what is it we know and how do we know that we know? Right, so if I say that um, I have knowledge, that I know X, well, how do I know that? Well, am I justified in saying that I know X? Right, and how do I have justification for that? How do I know that I know something? And so these are epistemic questions or epistemological questions that we might ask. Another would be, obviously you've heard of ethics. So what should we do? So ethics is a question of what's the right course of action. Ethics can also be questions about character. Right, so if we talk about something like virtue ethics, so which actions are right and which actions are wrong? What sort of character trait should I cultivate in myself and which sort of traits should I avoid or try to fix? And those are ethical questions. And so we can look at philosophy as a subject matter. So for example, my area is social and political philosophy and ethics, specifically children's rights. So when I look at an issue, I'm looking at those specific areas of philosophy by and large. Um, other people I know do epistemology. So their questions are questions of knowledge and how do we know things and how can we be certain that we know things? So depending on what you're doing, it might be that philosophy is just a different subject matter. But again, notice that there might be different methodologies that take place in these different areas. So rather than viewing it as a methodology, we can view it as a subject matter. What is the thing? It, what is it that you're studying? What is it the thing that the questions that you're asking? And that's how we can sort of categorize philosophy as some sort of subject matter. Finally, the last sort of approach, sort of broad approach to philosophy of what philosophy is, is that philosophy is an attitude. So it's not so much a methodology and not so much subject matter, but just a way of looking at the world. So to have a sort of philosophical perspective. So first, it's a form of intellectual independence. And what that means is that you take, you don't take for granted those things that you've grown up believing. So this could deal with anything. It could deal with morality. It could deal with religion, politics, um, your view of the world and what exists or doesn't exist in the world. All of these things mean that you are 
that you take a sort of critical eye to those things. You don't accept as true those things which you sort of haven't reflected on yourself. And so you don't accept just because someone says that something is true or false. You don't accept that. There's that intellectual independence. It's also sort of approaching things with a critical and systematic thoughtfulness. So again, this is all about attitude, right? That when I'm looking for an explanation for something, I'm going to be critical of views, right? I don't accept things just at face value, and I want to understand them in some sort of systematic way. And the third sort of, again, a type of attitude that one might take is sort of philosopher's intellectual gadfly. Now, a gadfly is like a big horsefly. And this, is, this sort of idea of gadfly is something that Plato attributes to his teacher Socrates. And what Socrates would do is go around and look for people who claim to be wise. So Socrates, the story of Socrates who goes to the Oracle of Delphi because someone has said that, oh, the Oracle has said that Socrates, you're the wisest man in Athens. And Socrates says, this can't possibly be the case. It's clearly things I don't know. I can't be the wisest man in Athens. And so in order to prove the oracle wrong, Socrates goes around and tries to find people who are wiser, right? So clearly, if there's someone wiser than him, then he can prove the oracle was wrong in saying that he's the wisest man in Athens. And what Socrates would do is go to someone who says, for example, oh, I know what courage is. So Socrates would go to a general, famous general who says, I know what, what courage is. Socrates would ask them for, ask the question, so what is courage? And the person would offer an explanation. You know, here's a definition of courage. And then Socrates would say, well, okay, if that's courage, then what about a case like this? Is, is that courageous? And he says, no, no, Socrates, that's not courageous. But, but isn't that what your definition says? So then the person would say, well, no, no, what I mean by a definition of courageous, I didn't mean what I just said. I meant this new definition, right? So they'd offer a second approach or definition to what courage is. And then Socrates would present another counterexample and say, well, but what about this case? Doesn't your definition imply this? And they said, no, no, Socrates, I would, this is what I actually meant. So they'd offer a third. And this would go on and on, right? This sort of intellectual gadfly, constantly sort of picking away what the, what the individual said. And at the end of the day, what's most sort of discouraging for those of you who might be interested in ancient philosophy, when you read the early Socratic dialogues, oftentimes the dialogue ends with the person Socrates questioning, saying something like, Ah, Socrates, the day is late, and I must go home now. And it would end without a resolution of what is the definition of courage. So you don't actually get an answer. But in some ways, you did get an answer. What Socrates realized was that this person who claimed to have knowledge didn't actually have knowledge. And so what Socrates ultimately comes to, the conclusion he comes to in his lifetime, is that why the oracle said that he's wise is he knows the fact of his own ignorance. He recognizes that there are things that he doesn't know, and that's what makes him wise. It's not He's not wise because he knows something. It's that he knows that he doesn't know. And so the early Socratic dialogues are all about Socrates going and asking these questions, and he got a reputation as this sort of annoying individual to the point where Socrates is eventually put to death in ancient Greece, right? He's sort of a, a scapegoat for the, the um, hard times that Greece had fallen upon in his lifetime. So philosopher's intellectual gadfly is someone who asks the tough questions, who doesn't accept the easy answer and wants to know, does this make sense, right? So having that sort of attitude, having a philosophical attitude is being intellectually independent and critical and systematic in your thinking and questioning, right? Being that gadfly, questioning even when that questioning is annoying. And what we'll see as we read some of the philosophers in this section is that for their time, although some of these works may seem very remote to you or some of the questions being asked may seem you know, sort of far away now that these aren't things that we normally think about, but these questions really did set these individuals apart, right? They, they were often controversial, the sort of views that they expressed. And so this, having this sort of attitude is what it means or what philosophy is. Philosophy is to take on a particular character trait, a particular attitude when looking at the world around you. So just to sum up, give you a few examples of the sorts of things that philosophers do or the sort of questions that philosophers may explore. Um, for example, we might talk about markets and the functions of markets, right? So the market we all understand, the exchange of goods and services for money. Say, well, that's what markets are for. They're to regulate the transfer of goods and services. But then there's the question of should everything be in a market? So very few people would object to the buying and selling of 
you know, smartphones. Nobody has a problem with that. Company produces a phone. They exchange that phone for money. In a marketplace, that seems perfectly appropriate. But then we could ask the question, should everything be in the market? So, for example, should you be able to sell your organs? So in some countries, it's you're allowed to sell your organs. Is there a problem with that? Is that okay? So even though we understand how markets work, you offer a product, set the market sets a price on that product, and then there's an exchange. Should everything be in the market? So, for example, is it okay to have a market in prostitution? What about markets in child pornography? Should those things be allowed? Well, why not? If markets are good things, we understand how markets function, what should or should not be in the market is also a philosophical question, right? So it's not enough to say that we understand markets, but there's that should or that ought question. How do I know what I know? Or how do I know that I know something? This is something that I've mentioned already in previous examples in epistemology, just questions of can we be sure about the things that we know. So this comes in our in early on in the course here, we look at proofs for God's existence. When someone says, I know God's ex God exists, or I believe God exists, well, the question was, how do you know that that's the case? So that's an epistemic question. And in other cases, it might be, how do I know that I actually know something? So these are sort of a further question that we can ask. Is a fetus a person? So we get into, in philosophy, we'll talk about very practical um, questions or very you know, um, applied questions, for example, in ethics. This becomes relevant in the, the abortion debate or stem cell research, for example. The status of the fetus, what do we mean by person? Again, this brings in all those sort of approaches that we've asked, right? We're looking at systematic um, a systematic approach. We're looking at the implications we want to. We're actually asking about concepts and meanings. All of those things might go into question of is a fetus a person and questions of er, questioning of everyday common sense assumptions, right? Why do do things have to be the way they are or why are things the way they are? Should they be the way they are? And questions about just things, for example, about the world, like what is the nature of the universe and how do we know what that is? What evidence do we have for that? So some of these border on sort of scientific questions, but generally are ones that science can't answer or hasn't yet answered, right? But we might ask questions about our everyday assumptions about the way things are. And it might even be our everyday assumptions about social arrangements. For example, questions about social justice and equality and the distribution of income or wealth or resources. All of these things might be questioning our everyday common sense assumptions, right? So the assumption that, well, if you work hard, um, you'll succeed. Well, is that actually true? And what is that assumption based on? Is that if everyone works hard, they'll always succeed? Are there other social factors? Are there environmental factors? Are there social structures that stop some people from succeeding while others don't? And how does access to resources influence the success of people and the amount of justice that we see in the world? So all of these become questioning our everyday assumptions about how life works, about how society works, um, even about how science or various disciplines work. So there are philosophy of science, there's philosophy of psychology, there's philosophy of economics. All of these are taking sort of a philosophical eye towards things that um, we sort of take for granted every day, or we assume we know. And they ask these sort of probing questions about the methodologies and the outcomes and the assumptions that these various areas or disciplines make.